who will not. Andrew Jackson, the only president in the history of the United States to openly defy a Supreme Court order. He is said to have remarked that Chief Justice Marshall made his decision, let him enforce it. And to the Georgians, he said, light a fire under them, they'll move. It's over. He wants us gone. Even those we call friends say we can't resist anymore. The political reality setting in, the issues became more clear. You could stay and fight or stay and resist or leave. And it was a very painful decision. It was an emotional decision. And it was the United States driving us intentionally into that uh, choice. Once Jackson had openly sided with Georgia, every day brought fresh stories of Cherokees being whipped, run from their farms, and even killed by white Georgians and the Cherokee Nation didn't have the strength to fight them off. When the United States renewed its offer of a cash settlement for Cherokee territory and a grant of land west of the Mississippi, the Ridges were ready to listen. At this point, the Ridges see the yielding of land as inevitable. What it's coming down to in their minds is a choice between preserving their land are preserving their sovereignty. So they believe it's more important to remain a sovereign nation and distance themselves from the threat that's imminent. I'm told it is much like here. We will come to think of it as home. Well, it is far. Too far for others, but not for us. They would have us leave our land and take up way out to the west, here. John Ross was a man in the middle. He knew where the people stood, but the ridges were Cherokee aristocracy, esteemed leaders in the nation. The family had plenty of friends in the US government, and Ross was not happy that John Ridge was preparing to run against him for principal chief in the upcoming tribal elections. This infighting, Ross believed, invited peril. He'd seen federal negotiators divide and conquer the leadership of every other nearby tribe. Unity, he knew, had been the Cherokee's salvation. The tribe had to speak to the United States with one voice. I think he heard the traditional voice and felt compelled by it, felt a sense of duty to it. Certainly, he had 16,000 people telling him to stay. I think he wanted to do what those voices were telling him to do. The Ridges kept saying publicly, if we could just talk to the Cherokee people, then we could convince them that this is our only option. And they felt like John Ross was being heavy-handed and keeping them from speaking as openly as they liked. 
The duty of the minority to yield and unite is sanctioned by patriotism and virtue, Ross proclaimed. Then, citing a national emergency, he suspended the upcoming tribal elections. When John Ross cancels elections, now there's a real block to John Ridge ever assuming what he knows to be his rightful position. He sees John Ross as a dictator, and he grows to hate the man in a very visceral way. The United States and Georgia got the scent of blood and dug deep at the rift that had opened between Chief Ross and the Ridges. Federal agents kept close contact with members of the Ridge faction and let it be known among all Cherokees. Ross's allies fanned rumors that the Ridges were illegally negotiating away Cherokee land and reminded the Ridge party that the penalty for selling land without the consent of the tribe was death. By the time the tribal leaders gathered for an emergency session at the Red Clay Council grounds in the summer of 1834, John Ross had taken aim at his old friend, Major Ridge. My fellow countrymen, the matter before us is most urgent. If the United States shall withdraw their solemn pledges of protection, deprive us of the right of self-government, and wrest from us our land, then in deep anguish of our misfortunes, we may justly say, there is no place for us. No confidence left that the United States shall be more just and faithful towards us in the barren prairies of the West than when we occupied the soil inherited from the great author of our existence. My father has with distinguished zeal and ability served his country. Is a man to be denounced for his opinion? If a man saw a cloud charged with rain and thunder and urged the people to take care, is that man to be hated or respected? There's a lengthy discussion, and it's decided to impeach John Ridge, Major Ridge, from the National Council. Amidst all of this, a member of the Ridge faction, John Walker, Jr., leaves early. And he is bushwhacked. His body's left out on the road as a signal. It's not just rhetoric anymore. People have to fear for their lives. There was no reconciling after Red Clay. John Ross insisted that if the Cherokees held tight, they could outlast the Jackson administration. A new president would surely honor the Supreme Court decision. The Ridges believed that what was left of American tolerance for Indian people was evaporating fast. It was time for the Cherokee leaders to take the best cash offered from Washington and get their people to safety west of the Mississippi.
In the last days of 1835, in defiance of Chief Ross and the National Council, a self-appointed group of Cherokee leaders met at the home of Elias Boudinot. In front of them was the newly negotiated Treaty of New Echota. In return for ceding all the tribal lands in the southeast, the Cherokee Nation would be paid $5 million, providing funds to relocate west of the Mississippi and to build schools, churches, and homes in their new land. The treaty party did not stand to benefit financially, but they knew that would be little comfort to their fellow citizens. None of them were under any illusions as to what they were doing. They knew it was contrary to the wishes of the majority of Cherokees. They knew that they had no authority to sign that treaty. They all knew that. To a large extent, they had come to believe what they had been telling themselves from the time of the Wooster decision. We see, we're the ones who know, we're the ones who have to take action to protect these people who don't understand. It must have been a very heavy load, knowing that the vast majority of Cherokee people would see them as traitors and worthy of the death penalty. 